Sit back, relax, and take a ride with us on the Gunblog Variety Cast, Episode 11. Welcome back to the Gunblog Variety Cast. I'm your host, Sean, from NC Gunblog, and with me today is Adam from Guns, Cars, Tech Blog. How are you doing, Adam? Better than I should be. Oh, so you're surviving on very little sleep with the new baby? Yes, yes. I get about, <laughs> I get about four hours of sleep a night, not in a row. <laughs> yeah, so. Poor dad. <laughs> well, let's go with the tactical dog and fitness report. All right. I did 31.6 dog walking miles, and I took Dices to the vet to get weighed. Mm-hmm. Uh, my wife says, hey, you know what? The dog's body condition is absolutely wonderful. This is exactly what I want the dog to weigh. Take her to the vet and get her weighed. So I took her to the vet. It was 57 and a half pounds. That sounds about right. Yep. She's a fair, for the type of dog she is, she's fairly little dog. I got a new Frisbee. In fact, we got two Frisbees. My wife wanted a, uh, a nicer Frisbee than the, the two pieces of junk we already had. So she bought herself a Zogo Flex. This is a West Paw Design Zogo Flex orange frisbee. It is a lifetime warranty. So if the dog tears it up, then we get a new one. Oh, nice. Nice. It actually flies pretty well, but I wanted to try the Jaws Hyperflex. Jaws makes a pretty strong frisbee. It's the frisbee that the frisbee dogs would use for practice, you know, and it's, mm-hmm. it's for dogs that are pretty hard on their frisbees. I wanted the Hyperflex because that one's a little bit softer so that it doesn't, you know, beat the dog up when she grabs it and stuff like that, right? Yeah. Um, I don't think the actual Jaws is all that tough, but I got the Hyperflex just in case. And it's purple, so that makes it even better. (laughs) I like it better because it flies like you want a flying disc to fly. It's just beautiful flyer. The the Hyperflex, excuse me, the Zogoflex flies pretty well, actually, but uh, the Hyperflex flies even better. Nice, nice. So uh, your dog weighs 57 and a half pounds. Right. And you have a Dutch Shepherd. Right. And I have a Belgian Malinois, which is basically a Dutch Shepherd that's differently colored. Right. So they're supposed to be about the same size. Uh, yours is 57 and a half pounds, which is about where they're supposed to be. Between The females are between 55 and 65 pounds. Uh, mine's 78 pounds right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she, but that's good. Uh, she was down from 84 uh, the last time I weighed her, about three or four weeks ago. We're making progress there. So lots of, lots of her running around in the backyard chasing after sticks. She's really enjoying that me and my wife are home with the, uh, with the baby. She kind of wonders where the, the other one is during the day. But, yeah. So there we are. <laughs> or the other one's off at school or yeah. at daycare or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's off at, uh, at daycare. And now it's time for Blue Collar Prepping with that bratty kid sister of the gun blogosphere, Aaron. Aaron wants to talk to us about get home bags. All right, Aaron, I spend a lot of time in my car, and I'm frequently worried, well, what if something bad happens? What if my car breaks down and I'm stuck in some place for a little bit of time? How do I ensure that I get home safely and you know don't starve on the road or die of thirst on the road? Well, Sean, that's why preppers have something that's called a get-home bag. And it is a small bag, usually about the size of a backpack, that is filled with food, change of clothes, and other supplies needed to either last you the few hours or to help you on your walk home. Well, what kind of stuff would you put in a get-home bag? And how's that different from a bug-out bag? Well, it's different from a bug-out bag in terms of duration. Uh, get-home is literally designed to get you home. For most people, that's a couple of hours to maybe a day if you're walking. A bug-out bag is a lot more intense. It's usually at least three days worth of gear, and that's the sort of thing that you do when you have to evacuate and leave your home. So it, it's a lot more permanent things. Bug out bag would have an actual tent, as opposed to a get home bag, which might just have a little poncho shelter. And uh, bug out bags are usually just larger, heavier. They got more stuff in them. What you would put in them? Well, it depends on your environment, and it depends on what your strategy is. A while back, 
uh, Linoge from Walls in the City did a really great uh, photo essay of what was in his get home bag, and I encourage everyone to go and look at that. He described what he needed it for, and he mentioned very specifically that because he lives in North Carolina, he was worried about ice storms. And so cold weather survival is certainly part of his get-home strategy. Yeah, that's true. Linoge lives across town from me, and it's, it is a consideration here where I doubt that it's a consideration for you. Exactly. I live in Florida where it gets down to freezing temperatures for about one, maybe two weeks in January. I'm not worried about freezing. What I am worried about is getting too wet, especially immersion foot. Uh, I'm worried about heat stroke. I'm worried about insect bites. So we've both got get-home bags that are about the same size. We've both built ours out of rather nice backpacks you can get at Walmart or Target. But because we live in two different areas, we've got two different design philosophies. Even though both of us are operating from the mindset of, well, our car breaks down or something else happens, the roads are impassable because of a disaster, and we have to walk to get home. Yeah, and I'm sure Kevin Baker out in Arizona would have something completely different than either of you, t- you two as well. Exactly. And of course, it depends on what your strategy is. Some people, like Linoja and myself, were planning on walking. Other people may just decide to stay in their car and wait for rescue, or just wait out the, what, the, the eight hours you're stuck in snowed-in traffic. That'll have a different philosophy. Right, and I travel some fairly long distances from home. If I'm 120 miles from my house, I'm not walking that. Yeah. But it'd be nice to have enough food to bridge from the time that I'm there, you know, the time that I realize that there's a problem until somebody comes to rescue me. Mm -hmm. Or I can hop a bus or a train or whatever it is I used to get home. Yeah, exactly. So I should run right out and go to the survival section and start packing survival foods into my uh, backpack and throw it in the trunk, right? Well, you can if you want. I wouldn't recommend it. One thing that a lot of people do is they see the words survival ration and they buy them. There is a link to one of my Blue Collar Prepping articles. It's called Don't Buy a $10 Cookie, and I encourage everyone to go to that link. I have posted several videos from uh, another guy. He's called Main Prepper, and he is uh, an army sergeant and a bodybuilder, and I think maybe he runs marathons, and this guy really knows his nutrition. And he tells you in no uncertain terms that these shrink wrap survival rations that you can get are basically $10 cookies. And while they will keep you alive, there aren't the sort of thing that you need if you're having to walk home. They'll do you if you're sitting in a life raft waiting for rescue, if you're holed up in a, in a FEMA camp, but they aren't proper nutrition, especially if you're burning calories trying to get home. Do they at least taste good? Mine didn't. Oh. So it's not even really a $10 cookie. It has a cookie-like consistency. It tasted, well, it had a vague coconut flavor, and it was kind of powdery. Oh, um, yeah. It, it, it was the cookie version of, of press board wood. Oh, well, that's very appealing. <laughs> yeah, so I, I wouldn't recommend people go out and buy those things. Uh, But the good news is there are things that you can put in your get-home bag or your bug-out bag uh, that will be better for you, and in a lot of cases, it's going to be fairly light, and you'd be surprised at what you can put in there. If we're not going to buy a $10 cookie, what kind of stuff can we put in there? Well, you got some options. You can buy some lighter things like um, trail mix. You can maybe, if you bring along a camp stove, small portable camp stove, you can take um, some rice and cook that. And if you're feeling really intrepid, you can actually bring along cans of of tuna or uh, the potted meats. Those will actually last fairly long, even even in um, 120 degree heat of your car. As long as you change them out about every three to six months, they'll be okay. Oh, so basically we just have to think about what sort of conditions that the food is going to be stored in in a hot trunk in the summertime here. And I guess in Florida, that's a consideration. Oh, definitely. And basically once we've done that, just the sort of stuff we might be able to carry with us and eat and and try to stay away from the really expensive stuff. Exactly. And there's going to be a more detailed breakdown of the types of foods you can bring 
in the show notes. All right, Aaron, where can we learn more about how to prep for these minor disasters that could be much more major if we didn't prep for them, but we really don't want to spend every penny we have? Well, you go to my blog, bluecollarprepping.blogspot.com. All right, Aaron, it's good to see you. See you next week. Thanks, guys. See you next week. If you'd like to read more from Erin, check out her personal blog, lurkingrhythmically.blogspot.com. Felons behaving badly. Greensboro man charged in fatal stabbing hears voices mother says. Of course he does. Well, you take a look at the picture of this guy. He looks like he's hearing voices right then and there. He does not. <laughs> oh, he wow. doesn't yeah, look 100%. That, that, that blank look in his eyes. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's hard, not look, it's hard to look at that picture and not feel some sort of sympathy for the guy. He doesn't look all there. Yeah. The mother of a man charged in a Sunday fatal stabbing said her son battles mental illness. Mom carried a handful of pill bottles into Guilford County District Court Monday where her son, suspect, stood accused of the death of a neighbor, victim. He's a mental case. She said of her son, he's been trying to get help for the longest time. According to an online drug reference, the medications the mother carried are used to treat schizophrenia as well as vocal and physical tics. He's been needing help, mom said. She added that her son did not take the medicine all the time. He hears voices and has depression. Suspect, 22, is accused of stabbing victim, 42, at his home Sunday. Victim died at the hospital. Suspect was arrested on Sunday. The men live within blocks of each other on Summit Avenue. I should point out that I always say suspect and victim. I don't say their names. Um, It's my policy not to give added fame to people who are accused of or convicted of crimes. I tend not to give victim names unless it's pretty clear that the victim is a totally innocent bystander. Uh, Frequently, that is not the case. The suspect has, has one conviction, Class A1 misdemeanor assault on a handicapped, and that is back in 2009. Interestingly, the victim is got a couple of felonies and a whole lot of other stuff. Hmm. DWI, possessed Schedule 6, burning personal property, Class H felony, misdemeanor breaking and entering, for some reason listed as felony Class H. I'm not sure how that worked. Felony breaking and entering, Class H, with the same date. Um, maybe it was upgraded for a probation revocation. I don't understand that one. Hmm. Driver's license revoked, DB level one, possess schedule two, possess schedule two, violation of protective order, misdemeanor breaking and entering, wanton injury to person or property, $200 or less, assault inflicting serious injury, law, probation, PAR official with duty. So uh, assault on a law enforcement officer or probation officer in the course of their duty. So the, su- the suspect has a-, a minor misdemeanor criminal record, and the victim in this case has a fairly serious felony criminal record. So the felon behaving badly here was actually the, the victim. Well, I don't know necessarily that, that he was behaving badly. I don't know any of the circumstances of the case. I can only say that it's amazing to me how frequently the people who end up dead tend to also have a criminal record. And that one's pretty extensive. Yeah, I think those two things tend to go together. And I will leave it to the readers and the listeners to determine how exactly that goes together. But I have noticed, now this case was a stabbing, but uh, one of the sort of ongoing jokes on the blog is the felon seeking bullets. Because how often do people fire guns randomly and those, ran- those random bullets randomly hit felons? Like how many felons were standing on that street corner that the only person that got shot was a felon? <laughs> That's a now, good like point. like I said, in this case, it's a, it's a knife. It wasn't a, it wasn't a shooting, but... Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting to me how frequently criminal acts happen to criminals. Yeah, it's almost like the people that you hang around with kind of maybe have something to do with how you end up. That does sound about right. Yeah. My father always told me that birds of a feather flock together. So if you want to know who you are, look at your friends. That and is if true. if your friends are a bunch of criminals, maybe you need new friends. They say that you are the average of your five closest friends. Oh, I'm good then. I don't have five closest friends, so I'm, I'm, I'm nothing. <laughs> so there's you, and there's your wife, and there's the dog. <laughs> yeah, so I'm good with a Frisbee, and I like to eat. <laughs> there you go. Because my wife likes to cook, so I'm the average of that. There you go. I, I've noticed that. I've noticed that in, in, in normal life, not just you know the criminals that I talk about. But if you want to know who your girlfriend is, look at her girlfriends. 
And that's yeah. who your girlfriend is. If you think your girlfriend is this, the unique person in that crowd of women who all do that one thing that you don't like, yeah, she does that too. <laughs> that's a good point. That's, some, that's yeah. some good advice for our younger listeners. Yeah, younger listeners, take a look at your girlfriend. If her female friends are all out messing around on their boyfriends, so is your girlfriend. Just saying. Just saying. I've seen this one close up. Ouch. Well, Nikki wants to talk to us about some foreign policy for grownups. Does the world need a leader? And is the United States that leader? Nikki, we frequently hear people complain about the United States being the world's policeman. What in the world is the problem with that? Well, the question is really, does the world need a policeman? Uh, Some people will say nature abhors a vacuum, so the world actually needs a leader. An association of nations is not going to handle that particular task. I mean, look at the United Nations. It's completely ineffective and completely wrong. It does absolutely nothing. If there's a crisis, they send out a strongly worded letter. That's about it, right? Yeah, they're a big waste of time if you ask me. Well, exactly. The world needs some kind of leadership. I recently read an article that said if we actually want to live in a world of laws, we need somebody to enforce those laws. So really, the question is, who would do that, right? Sounds about right. I'm not so sure we need to live in a world of laws that need to be enforced, but we certainly just, in my mind, can't leave things however they want to fall out. Would it be to people do whatever they want? Well, the world is full of bad actors. We can't avoid that. There's nothing that can be done about that. So the question is, is it going to be the United States or is it going to be someone else? Now. On the pro side, the United States is a natural leader. We have the largest economy and the strongest military. We spend more on defense than all of our NATO allies combined. We are the lone superpower in the world after the fall of the USSR. And, you know, as Spider-Man used to say, with great power comes great responsibility. Are you going to laugh at me now? Yeah, come on now. We're honestly, I don't feel like we're responsible for any of these people. Now, I think that there's a good argument to say, evil things must be punished. And if nobody else is willing to do it, I'm perfectly okay punishing them. But, oh, we're responsible? No, I'm not going to buy that. It's a definitional issue. We may not be responsible for everybody else. And I don't think there's anybody in the world that's going to claim that. But we are able to enforce the laws. We're able to exert the right pressure. We have smart leadership for the most part who knows when to use soft power, who knows when military action is necessary. We generally have very intelligent people who understand all of these issues. Now, on the con side, we can say that our leaders aren't any or more or less flawed than other nations' leaders, and that's true. I mean, look look at what we've got in, in leadership currently. Obviously, there are flaws. Now, the perception is also that we've become kind of, a, kind of a tyrant, a statist entity in the world. The perception is that we want to control, not lead, that we want American hegemony, that we want to impose our values on the rest of the world by force. Additionally, it's expensive. It involves foreign aid. It involves military expenditures in times of war. There's economic decisions. For example, when we impose sanctions on rogue regimes and when we use that soft power option, we also actually face consequences um, as far as our own economy is concerned. So there's a whole lot of issues and there are different ways to look at the United States leadership from the pro and the con side. But the real question is not whether or not we shouldn't or should be a leader. I think, frankly, we are. And that's just the state of things. Our size, our economy, our power, we are the natural leader in the world. The real question becomes, how do we walk that fine line between leading and between protecting our national interests, which, thanks to globalizations, have become tied with the rest of the world. So the world's national interests are actually our national interests. So the the real question is, how do we walk that fine line between providing stable leadership and imposing our will on others. And I think that's the biggest question that we need to answer. I read this article that you, sh- you uh, linked, The Telegraph, 
Mm -hmm. The title, We May Not Like It, But ISIS and Iraq Remind Us That We Need America to Be the World's Policeman. The particular person who wrote this is a former Labor Party, and I'm not sure what GMB trade union, but he's British. And yeah, he's British. left. He is absolutely not somebody that could ever be called a neocon. Correct. And I think he says something very, very, very true here. We want, and we want a policeman. When Boko Haram snatch our girls or Hamas launches its rocket and Israel launches its response or ISIS is on the march, at that moment we grab the phone and dial 911. At the end of that phone is always the same tired, overworked, world-weary cop. Sometimes the cop comes, at which point the crowd gathers and the people are saying, what are you doing here? This isn't your neighborhood, fascist pig. Sometimes the cop doesn't come, at which point the crowd gathers to chant, where the hell are you? People are dying. Don't you care? And yeah, it's damned if you do and damned if you don't. It is. That's absolutely right. And that's where the world perception comes in. I think we need to be cautious when we do provide that leadership that we don't become that, that militant hegemony that everybody fears. But at the same time, we need to understand and other people need to understand that being a leader is a natural state of thing state of things a leader a leaderless world is not going to be a world that anybody likes which is why they grab that phone which is why they call 911 and which is why they talk to that weary worldly cop because what the last thing they want is the anarchy that actually comes with nobody providing leadership somebody's going to be the person out there stomping the people that they don't like and if that person, if the people that, that get stomped are going to be stomped, I would prefer that it was me making the decision over who was getting stomped and not some other country, because their motivations might not be my motivations. You're talking about us in general, or are you talking about the person who picks up the phone and actually dials that 911? In the world, there are occasionally people who need to get stomped flat. Sure. And if that's going to happen... I would much prefer that the people doing the stomping was us here in America, because for the most part, I understand the motivations, I trust the people, and I would much prefer it to be us doing it and us making the decisions than to hand that off to some other people who might have very different ideas over where they want the world to go. And, and I agree, and I think a lot of the world agrees with your sentiments, which is why they naturally look toward the United States to provide that leadership. All right, Nikki, it was good to talk to you. I'll see you again next week. You bet. Take care. Well, Nikki blogs at thelibertyzone.com. Strange laws. This one's not a gun law. This one's an interesting law. Uh, in North Carolina, it is illegal to burn a cross on the property of another without permission. Okay. That's uh, chapter 14, 12.12. .12. Placing burning or flaming cross on property of another, or a public street or highway, or on any public place. It shall be unlawful for any person or persons to place or cause to be placed on the property of another, in this state, a burning or flaming cross, or any manner of exhibit in which a burning or flaming cross, real or simulated, is a whole or a part, without first obtaining written permission of the owner or occupier of the premises to do so. <laughs> it shall be unlawful for any person or persons to place or cause to be placed on the property of another in this state or on a public street or highway or in any public place, a burning or flaming cross or any manner of exhibit in which a burning or flaming cross, real or simulated, in whole or in part, with the intention of intimidating any person or persons of a, or of preventing them from doing any act which is lawful or causing them to do any act which is unlawful. So if you're going to go burn a cross on the property of that black couple that moved into your neighborhood, you need to get written permission from them before First. you do it. Right. That would make it that would make it legal. Now, we're not saying that we don't that we think that people should be able to just, you know, set up burning crosses in people's yards. What's funny here is why isn't this just arson? It's only arson if you burn their property. You can burn your own property. If you put your property on their property and then you threaten them and they're like and they have to press charges against you, they're probably less likely to press charges against you. But when you have the law that says, hey, you know, you have to have written permission. They treat it exactly like hunting. If I go and hunt with a rifle on another person's property, I have to have written permission in my pocket to show the game warden that they said it was okay for me to do that. Hmm, I did not know it's that. It's exactly the same thing. How many KKK members are going to have written permission signed by the homeowner to burn the cross on this poor family's property? I'm going to go with zero. 
zero. So it's not so, the sort of thing that's going to happen. So uh, it's an interesting law. I think it's only like a misdemeanor. I'd have to take a look, but it's not a very serious crime, but it is in fact a crime. This dates from 1953. Mm-hmm. Now, if you show up on my lawn with your burning cross, you're going to catch a bullet. Probably, Because yeah. you start something burning on my property, I have every reason to believe you're going to start everything on my property burning, and I'm going to shoot you first. Yeah, and I don't think anybody else would have a problem with that. I think my whole neighborhood would stand up and cheer. I, you, you're probably right. Now, Miguel wants to talk to us about Miami Vice and its influence on the gun culture and on guns in general. Miguel, you've lived a long time in Miami. Mm-hmm. How did Miami Vice change how firearms were seen in a normal American culture? Well, it's been actually this year's the 30th anniversary of Miami Vice coming out on TV. And uh, it, the whole show, per se, had a great effect on TV and even in Miami, especially with guns. Nobody mentions the guns. And Michael Mann, who happens to be a graduate from Gun Sight, did a heck of a job uh, bringing guns to, to the mainstream, you know, making them cool. Well, nobody actually gives him too much of, of a credit. Okay, Gun Sight. What exactly is Gun Sight? Gun Sight is the school that Colonel Jeff Cooper founded to teach uh, basic handgun techniques, as if he's the father of the modern handgun techniques. In those days, there really wasn't much in the way of high-end pistol training. You know, you could go to the gun store and somebody who ran a gun store would teach you how to shoot. But Gun Sight was probably the only, I guess we could call it a mega school for, for firearms technique. Michael Mann, what did he do for Miami Vice that him being a good uh, student of the gun taught him? Michael Mann, he did two things. He brought to the consciousness a whole bunch of guns that were in the market, that were out there, but the regular American viewer did not see. Okay, back then, you know, the good guys had a either a, a Smith & Wesson snub nose, a call detective. If it was a big revolver, it was uh, the Model 10. Maybe, you know, this is a, a Dirty Harry had a Model 29, but, you know, Dirty Harry was not the, the, the clean and pure action hero for TV. And maybe you'll see the good uh, private detective or some other cop carrying a 1911. That was it. Okay, the bad guys will also have maybe one of those Model 10s or called police, police positive and a snub nose and um, maybe a Luger because, you know, that's the eternal gun of the bad guys. <laughs> yeah. Maybe some foreign guy that came visit and do something in the United States had a, a Walther PPK. But that was about it. I mean, long guns. Long guns was uh, maybe uh, your standard M16 that the, the SWAT guys all dressed in black with the funny caps had. Uh, a bolt action rifle with, with a scope on top. Uh, Remington 870. That was it. You, couldn't, you didn't see anything else weird. Michael Mann brings all those guns that were exotic at a time, they are now, now common. You have Sonny Crockett, main character, not only, you know, shooting a non-standard gun, he's shooting a non-standard caliber. Sonny Crockett, first year, first season, is shooting a Brent 10, a 1911 pattern gun in a 10 millimeter cartridge. 10 millimeter cartridge, when Miami Vice comes out, is a brand new cartridge developed for the FBI. So all of a sudden it's like, okay, he's got a weird gun. All of a sudden, uh, from not knowing, you know, maybe uh, the American people knew two types of machine gun, two, three types. The M3 grease gun, something they seen in the movies, the Thompson machine gun, and what they call the Smyser, which is actually the MP40, the German machine gun. One year later, Uzi and Mac-10 are household n- names. <laughs> uh, I once had somebody at a gun show explain to me, this is a guy that was selling uh, uh, M1 Garands, he said that there were two things that sold guns, fear and Hollywood. You either bought a gun because you wanted to protect yourself, or you bought a gun because you wanted the gun in the movie. So you're saying that uh, Miami Vice ha- was a uh, was a big driver of what kind of guns people wanted? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Believe it or not, everybody wanted to have the Mac 10, and you know they were growing out of trees. And you know, according to the uh, to the Florida legislature, you could buy one of the uh, every 7-Eleven. You know, kind of BS. But... <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, but all of a sudden, you know, you you, you start to see. The amount of different weapons available that Michael Mann had in Miami Vice was ridiculous, but it was fantastic. I mean, all of a sudden you have an M60 machine gun popping out of the back of a band in uh, uh, in Collins Avenue in uh, in Miami Beach, and he's hosting down tourists and old people. Then again, you may have 
somebody carrying a, a six hour P220. Who the heck knew six hours in, in, in the early 80s? You may have also like Dan Wesson is, a, I mean, a boutique farm. Okay. And, all, and then you can go back all the way to a, a Berlin, like Cheetah. The variety, it was so immense. And this is just on the, on the first season that people were saying, I've never seen their gun. What kind of gun is that? I want that one. I never watched a single episode of Miami Vice. It was on past my bedtime. It wasn't a TV show that my parents would have let me watch, given all the machine gunning people going down Miami Boulevard. You sheltered life. Yes, I did. I lived a sheltered life. Did they make a deal out of what kind of guns everybody had? Did people explain, hey, this is such and such a gun? Or did you just have to figure it out when you saw it? You had to figure it out. I mean, it was it was there. I mean, they didn't have a time to, to explain it. Maybe if there was a an episode dealing with uh, gun trafficking, yeah, they would tell you. And even though back then, you know, even if it was Michael Mann and all the stuff, you would have to die with, you know, some Hollywood preconceptions, you know, cop killer bullets and all that kind of stuff. But no, I mean, it was just the visual. Like I said, you know, forget about I was saying, you know, the only shotgun was the, the before, it was the, the rhyming, rhyming song, or maybe a Mossberg. All of a sudden, you, you're seeing Francis Pass, you're seeing uh, Browning out of fights, which is an old shotgun, but it was never cool, okay? The high standard Model 10, it would look something out of the Star Wars. And, and, and you see it was one of the cops carrying it on, on, on a raid. And it's like, what kind of stuff is that? Is that a rifle? Is that a shotgun? So just by bringing it to, to, to the visual, I mean, it, it wasn't an educational show by any means, okay? But they brought stuff that you never seen before. And from, you know, like I said, you had the, 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 the MP5, that's the other one. You never seen a freaking MP5 unless it was some tactical thing, whatever, and we know it now, okay? Back then, nobody knew what an MP5 was, and then all of a sudden, it's the coolest, one of the coolest guns in Miami Vice. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, but they were not only uh, doing the, the, the cool latest guns. One of the things, that in one of the episodes, they have a, blunder, uh, a blunderbuss. <laughs> okay, and, and, and to use the, the old guy in, in, in this in, on the show used to to hunt gators illegally, but he they, <laughs> he blows a freaking hole in one of the, the drug dealers with that with that thing. So you you had a, a little bit of everything, and it was a lot of fun. And you gotta give it to Michael Mann because he 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 brought uh, he made guns look cool, and we are b- better off for it. All right, Miguel, it was good to talk to you. See you next week. See you next week. We'll get more Miguel Gonzalez daily at gunfreezone.net. So as part of show prep, I listened to this interview yesterday and today on Netflix, I subscribed to uh, Miami Vice and watched the first two episodes. And sure enough, there's a full auto tech nine in the first episode. (laughs) (laughs) I still haven't watched any of them. I think you have a better excuse than I do. I wasn't allowed to stay up that late. Yeah. And I think I was two. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's interesting sometimes, you know, hearing the, how our culture came about from people who were there and, you know, were paying attention when you weren't. Yeah. And, and the other thing that struck me during this interview was I wonder if there was any effect that this had on getting the Hughes Amendment in 1986 passed. <laughs> I wonder. Yeah. So. Fun with headlines. What do you got for us today? All right. So this one is actually not one that I found. Uh, a couple of other people found it. It has been made, making the rounds. I originally got it from Ace of Spades HQ, which is a great blog. It's ace.mu.nu. So basically, I'll give you the story first. And this was an AP story, and they changed the headline several times. The story is basically that a member of Hamas got in a car and drove through a crowd of people at a train station in Jerusalem. He sped away, and Israeli police shot him. Uh, I don't think they killed him, but he injured eight people and killed a baby. So that is, that is what happened. Here's the way the AP headlined it. Israeli police shoot man in East Jerusalem. Now, does that capture the essence of the story, do you think? Well, it is factual. It is it factual. Is short. And you can write it in really big letters. Yes. Apparently, um, somebody realized that maybe that that wasn't exactly an accurate headline, you know, because that's that's not really kind of the the main part of the story. So they so they rewrote the headline. 
car slams into East Jerusalem train station. That's a bit like <laughs> gun kills 17 at Gabby Gifford's meeting, you know? No, there was a dude driving that, right? And it didn't slam into the train station. It slammed into a crowd of people at the train station. You know, it's not like, you know, he, he accidentally drove into a convenience store or something. No, no, no. Th- this guy, you know, mowed down a crowd of people. Uh, apparently, they got a little bit more flack for that. And so they finally changed it to the, the correct headline, Palestinian kills baby at Jerusalem station, which is pretty much what happened. So just remember, these things happen all the time. If you just read headlines, you'll go on thinking that there was just some either a horrible accident at a train station or um, Israeli police are just, you know, going all NYPD and just shooting up the place. Remember, if you're writing the news, your job is to disseminate the news, not hide it. Yeah, there's actually a phrase for that. It's called burying the lead. You're supposed to not do that. That's true. Well, Baron wants to talk to us about smart guns and his perspective as an engineer in Tech Tips with the Baron. Baron, we've done so much in the last hundred years to improve the safety of our vehicles. Why can't we just uh, have smart guns? Wouldn't that improve the safety of our firearms? Well, see, the problem is, is when it comes to the design of firearms, there's a different approach that we have towards safety. There's fail safe and what is also commonly referred to as fail closed, which would be an unsafe condition. When we have problems with a firearm, we still want it to go bang when we pull the trigger. Now, that's not to say that we want our safeties to just randomly fail. It's, I don't want the safety to ever fail. And if it does fail, I still want to be able to pull the trigger because odds are in that instant, if I'm really worried about it, there is probably a good reason why I just want it to go bang. Okay, I think we have a a direct example of the safeties causing problems with the firearm. Who is it that has the revolver? It has like a a key lock, and sometimes that fails and locks up the gun. Is that like the Smith & Wesson lightweight revolvers? I think that was the Smith & Wesson lightweight revolvers had that. There was also another company for a while now that I'm trying to remember. I think they had a key on their bolt-action rifles. Okay, so basically smart guns... Uh, the, the personalized guns, sometimes people like to call them, that only will fire for the right person. Uh, what's the problem with that? Well, what's the problem with that? What happens if, for instance, I'm out for with my wife in downtown Seattle, and we're out at dinner, and something s- causes me to flip into condition orange, and my wife immediately moves to my strong side. I'm now in between her and somebody else. And all of a sudden, we go from orange to red. The fight is on. Now, I am in a position where I can physically restrain and block the individual meaning to do us harm. At the same time, my wife is in a position where she can pull my firearm. But wait, I have a smart gun. My wife can't use my firearm now. So we have actually thrown away one of the potential uses where I can go hand to hand with both hands to provide space for my wife who can then, you know, once she's backed off and has a clear engagement distance, I can then remove myself from that situation and, oh, she can perforate the individual. But wait, smart gun, that can't happen. So that's pretty much the reason the military would almost never, I can't imagine any circumstance where the military would have smart guns because if you find a rifle, you want to be able to use it because what in the world good is a rifle in a battlefield if it won't shoot people? It's a stick at that point. Same exact problem for police officers. If a officer has a failure of his weapon and needs to go into his buddy's cruiser to grab his AR, or he shows up at a scene and doesn't have an AR, but there's an AR in the cruiser that he can use, what if it's not programmed for him? That's a useless gun. He is now in a gunfight and doesn't have a gun. Seems to me that uh, anti-gunners have a very different set of goals than we do. Our goal is is the the firearm is uh, is an emergency device, and we want it to work in that emergency. And their view of firearms is, is it's a privilege, and if it doesn't work well, then too bad for you. Yes, and the worst part about that is the anti-gunners look at us and say, well, if it doesn't work in an emergency, it's your fault because you had a gun and you should have picked some other option. You should have dialed 911. So what other problems do these smart guns have other than they may not work? 
there's actually a bunch of different things that I can do. For instance, there's an electromagnetic signature out of coming out of the gun. Odds are, in one form or another, I will be able to track you. Not only would I be able to track you, but all that circuitry that's in there, what would happen if I directed, say, a high-gain antenna and a bunch of radio RF at it? I could probably cause the circuitry to either front-end overload, which would result in it not working. I would brick your gun. I could point a little antenna at your gun, and it would disable, and there would be not a thing you could do about it. Well, isn't that what we want? Don't we want the police to be able to point their uh, antennas at people and turn off their guns? The anti-gunners do. I'm not entirely sure that I'm comfortable with this. (laughs) Me neither. But I guess that makes us horrible, terrible, dangerous insurrectionists, though. I believe it was Lad Everett who said that I was the most despicable. Oh, it was me and Joe Huffman. (laughs) I saw something very recently on Ars Technica where they were talking about something that was going to go into police guns. That doesn't bother me nearly as much. What do you think of it? So I actually saw this as well, and actually, I really like it. For those who haven't seen the article, it'll be in the show notes. What they're doing is they're creating a small device. Currently, from the diagrams they showed, it's going in the back strap. I have a feeling in the end it's actually going to attach to the Picatinny rail. But all it does is provide telemetry. It can automatically notify dispatch when an officer has unholstered his gun. It can immediately notify when the gun has been fired. And my immediate thought was, if you attach this to the Picatinny rail, you can also put a camera on it. And now you can have solid footage from the muzzle of the gun of exactly what went down. When a police officer pulls a gun, I think it's, you know, we're, we're using force from the state. I would really like to have as much of record of that as possible. We've seen in some circumstances... Uh, recently where it would be a really good idea had the uh, had the state had some really good telemetry. Hey, this is what happened, and they don't have it. But also, he pulls his gun, all of a sudden dispatch knows, well, they know to start sending help. He might not have time to get to that radio. That's right. I would not trust it to notify dispatch. The officer should still try. Technology fails. But at the same time, it's an extra tool, and it's a tool that helps the officer, and not only does it help the officer, It also helps the person on the other side because it gets more eyes on the scene. It gets more people there. It helps provide an independent view from the view of the camera of what exactly transpired. And that, by far, is the most important thing. Because, yes, officers can wear body cameras. Sometimes they end up being turned off. If it's attached to the firearm and it is entirely automatic and can't be turned off, it's really, really difficult to avoid that independent judgment of what went down all right baron it's good to talk to you see you next week see you next week sean well baron still blogs at the-minuteman.org all right so a couple of weeks ago maybe it was last week uh we talked about my scope for my long range rifle uh how it was kind of messed up. I sent that off. Oh, this was a couple of weeks ago you were talking about, you found out that the reticle didn't move at all, no matter how far you twisted the knobs. Yes. Actually, I think I discovered that on uh, September 30th and it's now, so that was a month ago. Uh, it is now on its way back to me. Bushnell has repaired it. It's, uh, I should have it next week and I'm super excited to get back out to the range. The other thing that's got me pretty stoked this week is, uh, TACCON, the makers of the 3MR trigger, that's the one that has uh, the third mode is what they call it, uh, where it actually, you go to the full auto position with your AR trigger or your AR selector, and in that third mode, it actually uses the bolt going forward to somehow push the trigger forward to reset. So if you just really hold the trigger down hard, then it simulates full auto fire. Those guys have now introduced a new trigger. It's not actually out yet. It's called the TACCON 241, and it changes that to uh, you have a safe position. The normal semi-auto position is that that kind of 3MR position where it's uh, that pseudo full auto. And then the third position is now like a one-pound two, two-stage trigger. It's three and a half pounds for the first stage and one pound for the second, t- second stage. So that is really interesting to me because that means that you could have the one rifle do both kind of run and gun work and then also more long distance stuff. So this would be like a really good trigger for three gun, although it's probably not legal. So I'm really excited to see that. Okay, cool. 
Well, Weird wants to talk to us about how anti-gunners tend to go back and forth between nobody wants to take your guns and, hey, wouldn't it be great if everybody just had their guns taken away? In This This Week week in Anti-Gun Nuttery. Weird, we keep telling the gun grabbers that we don't want to compromise with them because each compromise represents one more step down the road to confiscation. They scream at us and tell us, no one is coming for your guns. Is that true, or are they just trying to misdirect us? Well, here's an easy way to deal with this, Sean. I went to the uh, mouth of a pretty uh, well-known gun control supporter and uh, took words that she said openly on her websites. So who we're dealing with here is Joan Peterson, and I think I want to make it clear on why I like to pick on Joan. Joan's not just any old person talking about gun. Joan sits on the board of directors of the Brady Campaign. And she's, and she's one of the pre- co-presidents of uh, Protect Minnesota, which is a Joyce Foundation-funded anti-gun group. And she is open about all these statements, and they are perfectly fine with them representing their name. So I think she speaks for the anti-gun group as a whole. She's a spokesperson for actual anti-gun groups, so that makes her fair game. Absolutely. And it also makes her words mean a lot more than just her speaking, you know, alone on her blog. She, when she speaks... She is speaking for the Brady campaign. So what's Joan say about this? All right. Well, first up, we've got a trip. We've got one from her trip, recent trip to Italy. She says, so things are quite different in Italy uh, pertaining to guns, who can buy them, how many can be owned, and where they can be carried and requirements for registering guns with the government. God forbid. People in Italy have to register firearms. What's next? Surely they'll be confiscated next, right? Wrong. She says, surely they won't be confiscated because, you know, obviously the Italians haven't confiscated all the guns. Does she say anything that uh, that might contradict that? Because I've heard her say some things that sounded like she wanted to confiscate. Oh, sure. Let's go on to uh, another one here. Uh, let's see. 68% of school shooters get their guns from homes, according to the Brady Center to Prevent Gun Violence. Uh, Brady Center has a new campaign highlighting the facts about kids and guns. No gun law will stop all of this, but if we don't start passing some laws to prevent at least some of our shootings, the message we send is anything goes. Laws are passed for a reason. I write about these laws when I travel to other countries. In those countries, some, for the most part, are pe- people are not shooting at police officers because they hate them. Kids are not bringing guns to schools and killing other kids. Why, uh, when they have, uh, as in Scotland, laws are passed to stop the next one from happening, or in Australia, where no mass shootings has occurred since the Port Arthur shooting, because the country decided that gun, gun laws had to change. Well, I mean, Scotland and Australia, they confiscated the firearms, didn't they? They sure did. In one breath, she's saying, oh, well, you know, we're not going to confiscate. Just because they're registered doesn't mean we want to confiscate them. Oh, yeah, in Scotland and Australia, they confiscated them. Isn't that a great thing? Yeah, and how'd they confiscate them? Through a registry. They obviously had to have a list of where they were. Exactly. Yep, actually, yeah, they did. how they confiscated them was they didn't actually confiscate them. They essentially gave people a, uh, an amnesty to turn them in. And then after that point, if they hadn't if they hadn't turned them in, then all of a sudden they were committing a crime and they could arrest them. Okay, so what else does she say? So here's another one that uh, that goes the other direction. It has some unreasonable fear that uh, that if they agree with me, something terrible will happen. Like for instance, someone is going to come around to their house and seize their precious guns. What a ridiculous and unfounded belief! But believe it, they do. Well, yeah, it's kind of hard for us not to believe it when she just a minute ago was saying, hey, you know, the Port Arthur massacre, they took all the guns away. Isn't that a great thing? Mm hmm. We can go back to uh, the other side to it. And, you know, in a different post, she says you can use them for home, home defense and hunting. Really? But do you absolutely need them for those uses or, or is it that you just want them? And what's more, he, he underscores their appeal. They're popular, they're sexy, and they're affordable, Larson says. He's also aware of the, the dread these firearms strike uh, in the uninitiated. It's a black gun. It's an evil gun. Ah, now I get it. Gun right act- activists are about what they uh, want and not just what they need. And they have convinced many in Congress and our legislators that they want is uh, what, what they need, thereby getting laws passed to make sure they have everything they want. And oh yes, the gun lobby is also good for stopping any kind of region- re- reasonable legislation that would keep them from having every gun and every type of ammunition they want. Okay, so clearly she's talking about the dreaded assault weapons. That is correct. So we can use them for home defense and for hunting, but do we really need them? Maybe she doesn't want to confiscate all guns, just, you know, AR-15s and anything that holds more than however many bullets she thinks that we're allowed to have. Yep. Do we have anything that she directly says that where we can say, hey, we want to take away these particular firearms? Yeah, actually, from her own uh, group, uh, Protect Minnesota. 
It says, gun deaths and injuries in Minnesota, the solutions. Join Protect Minnesota. We support getting assault weapons and high-capacity magazines out of circulation. She's one of the two presidents. It would be very difficult for her to say, oh, well, I don't believe in this, if she's the president or one of the two presidents of the group. She's very clearly saying, assault weapons and high capacity, whatever that means, magazines, need to be confiscated. Correct, yes. She says out of circulation. So we're not talking about the 94 ban, where guns were still in private hands and could be circulated around, just the supply was diminished. No, indeed, she wants them out of circulation, which is either meaning that she wants to outright had them confiscated or do it the soft way by banning the transfer of those guns so that eventually when people die off they uh, can't they can't transfer them to their families and to their to their loved ones and uh, so they have to be destroyed maybe confiscate means something different to her than it does to me what does it mean to you confiscate means that they're going to take it from you and that sounds a whole lot like that is exactly what they plan it sure is as a matter of fact, uh, she said in, uh, in, in, a, in a comment on her, on her own blog of the, uh, I guess uh, your definition uh, of confiscation is different than mine. From the article length, more than uh, 160,000 handguns have been surrendered by their owners since the new laws introduced following the Dunblay massacre in the UK, uh, the UK government is revealed. Confiscate, to seize private property for the, for the public treasury. To seize as if by authority, see cinnamon's appropriate, the, the, she's quoting the dif, d- dictionary de- definition right here. And then she says, gun owners in the UK were compensated for their guns uh, turned in, through, the, through though it took longer than they expected. I don't even know what to say to that. I am pretty sure that the 160,000 handguns that were turned in after the Dunblane Massacre weren't turned in out of the goodness of anybody's heart. They were turned in because the alternative was the police were going to show up at their house and cart the people off to jail. That's confiscation. Exactly. All right, Weird. Once again, you've uncovered somebody who is not arguing in good faith. It's good to talk with you, and see you next week. Talk to you later, Sean. In addition to appearing here, Weird is a regular host at The Squirrel Report and blogs at weirdworld.com. That's W-E-E-R-D world.com. Stuff that grinds my gears. I was looking for something for our strange gun laws or strange laws, and, and I thought, well, you know, everybody posts these weird laws of X state, right? Right. I, that's, I'll go there, because, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be a gun law. It could be just a strange law. I asked my wife, hey, you know any strange laws? And she's like, oh, yeah, Boone said you couldn't have more than two unrelated women living in the same house because that was a brothel. I looked that up. That turned out not to be the case. Couldn't have more than two unrelated people of any sex living in a house. And that was a zoning law. And that had (laughs) nothing to do with brothels, had nothing to do with women. They just didn't want a bunch of students renting different rooms in a house and messing up their property values. Oh, yeah. And it's different zones have different rules to depend on how many people they wanted to allow in. So I finally, I just, all right, look, let's take a look at the strange, strange, bizarre laws. And I found repeatedly the same things over and over and over again. And I'm not picking on this particular one. These guy, This guy here had the same laws as everybody else did. But since they had a top 10, it was the top 10 most bizarre North Carolina laws. And I thought, wow, this is great. Except none of them have any references. And then I started trying to track them down. The top 10 most bizarre North Carolina laws, number 10. If you sing off key, you might want to make sure you only sing while in the shower because singing off key is illegal. Well, you know, funny thing, is the North Carolina general statutes are posted online and nowhere, nowhere does the word sing appear (laughs) in the NC general statutes. Well, but my brother's cousin's friend's sister's boyfriend's mom said that that happened to her. Yeah, I don't care. It doesn't say sing. (laughs) And there's two times the word song appears in the general statutes. One of them is the state song of North Carolina. And Uh the other one is the state toast of North Carolina. (laughs) Apparently, according to, the, to basically everybody, it is illegal to use an elephant to plow a cotton field. Well, now that's reasonable. That is, maybe that is a reasonable thing for you to say, hey, you shouldn't do this. The one problem is, is the word elephant does not appear in the NC general statutes. <sighs> Nor does the word pachyderm. I checked that one too. And I'd looked at cotton and nowhere on any of the cotton laws does it say that you can't use an elephant to plow the field. It doesn't say, you know, it's funny. It's like, oh, you can't use it to plow the field. What, can you use an elephant to harvest? To pull the cotton <laughs> shit or something? Well, I, eh, where do people get this stuff? 
that would violate the spirit of the fake law. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, and a- apparently, uh, everybody seems to think that it's illegal to sneeze on a city street in Asheville. Well, Asheville city ordinances are online, and the word sneeze does not appear. No. Oh. This one is my favorite. If you own cats and dogs and you allow them to fight, you could be issued a citation if you live in the city of Barber, B-A-R-B-E-R. Allowing cats and dogs to fight is illegal. Not only can I not find an ordinance that says that, I can't find a city or town of Barber, North Carolina. (laughs) I'm not sure this place even exists. Okay, that's, I, that takes the cake I'm, I'm right I'm like, there. that can't be true. I mean, you know, it's one thing to get the laws wrong, but, like, they don't even know that the city doesn't exist. If there is a barber in North Carolina, somebody please tell me where this is, because <laughs> I can't even find it on Google Maps. And pretty much if Google Maps can't find a town, that town doesn't exist. I mean, seriously. You're going to get some angry emails from the three people that live in Barber, North Carolina. You know, we might find out that it's, like, Barber's Corner or something like that. It's, now, that you know, would make sense, you know, yeah. You know, it, it, it's... But if you put in barber, it, it, it gives you the, the, like the state barber's board or something like that. <laughs> if you Google barber North Carolina, you get the idiot dude who runs the NAACP in this, in this state. Some, hmm. Somebody or other barber. Oh, okay. But yeah, I, I, I can't find a barber, much less. Now, let's put all that aside. The lack of town, the lack of ordinance in the imaginary town. Guess what? If you allow your cats and dogs to fight with each other, it's actually against the state law because that's called cruelty to animals. Oh. It's not really that strange a law, is it? The fi- fictitious city of Barber was trying to make it illegaler because we all know if you make it illegaler, that prevents something from happening entirely. Okay, yeah. Now, here's a great one. If you buy a white robe and hood, you may be asked if you are joining the KKK. If you do so, you will have to pay $3 in additional taxes per robe hood in the state of North Carolina. This refers to the infamous white goods tax. White goods. Except for one problem. What's a white good? A white good is a refrigerator or a (laughs) stove or any large appliance that goes in your kitchen (laughs) or like your washing machine or your dryer, your washer, that sort of thing. Because I actually looked this up. I typed in NC white good tax and I went to the NC... Department of Revenue, and it's here's your $3 tax. And it explains very carefully. It's a disposal tax on large appliances. That's fantastic. It has nothing whatsoever to do with the KKK or sheets. It's <sighs> if you put a stove on your head, yes, you have to pay a $3 tax on the stove you put on your head. You probably have to pay a headache tax for being freaking stupid, but, you know, has nothing to do with the KKK. So, guys, pay attention here when you're going to put stupid things on. Hey, these guys managed to invent an entire town, so, <laughs> I mean, I can't really complain that they don't know the difference between a white good and a sheet. Um, here's one. In North Carolina, if you're caught with illegal drugs, in addition to receiving a save the date for your court appearance, you also have to pay taxes on your illegal drugs. This is actually true. Okay. Now, you might be familiar with that because they had the same sort of thing in Tennessee. They did. And guess what? It was overturned by the state Supreme Court in Tennessee, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And in North Carolina, you don't have to identify yourself. You just have to go to the Department of Revenue and request your, uh, your tax stamp. You don't have to tell them what you're putting it on. You just have to pay your tax stamp. Now, we all know if you go to the Department of Revenue and say, hey, I want a tax stamp for my illegal goods, they're going to follow you. Yeah. yeah. And so basically, I think that'd probably be overturned on Fifth Amendment grounds. You know, that's self-incrimination right there. I have half a mind to go and get one just for the entertainment value of having one, just to say that I did it, but I don't know that I want that kind of action. I want to say that uh, we had that law here in Tennessee for, I don't, I don't know, a dozen years or so. People actually did go and, and buy these stamps. Uh, they were stamp collectors. <laughs> Apparently, it's still a law in Charlotte. A woman's attire must cover at least... 16 yards of her body. I don't think that makes any sense. Uh, they're probably saying it needs 16 yards of material. Yeah. By the way, that's a lot. 16 yards of material is an incredible amount of material. You could go sailing with that. Even 45 inch wide material that's 16 yards long. Wow. That's a lot of fabric. Seriously, you can make a parachute out of that. Yeah. And strangely enough, fabric, clothing, I searched it all in the Charlotte ordinances. Nothing. Nothing at all. (laughs) Number three, here in North Carolina, the only position you are legally allowed to have sex is the missionary position. Um, Will somebody please find a link to this law? Because I don't even know how to search for that. 
I don't think that exists. I am almost certain that there's nothing in the law that says only in the missionary position. Because how would you even write a law that says if you had sex in some other position? Um, I no, I yeah, don't see it. I didn't, honestly, I don't even. How would you begin to search that? Sodomy. Uh, no, and see that's overturned by the Supreme Court. Even though, and we do have a crimes against nature law, but the only time that crimes against nature is enforced is is a if you do it with an animal, or b if the person who is having it prosecuted against them it was a prostitute John relationship. Mm. That that's what they get charged with in that because I think our prostitution law might be a little more narrowly defined. I don't know the ins and outs of that. I don't really need to know the ins and outs of the prostitution law. Yeah, you're not going to be. Taking you know, I know all about particular... the gun laws because I carry a gun, right? But I don't get involved with prostitution, so yeah. I don't need to know that law. Outside your wheelhouse, not something you yeah need to concern really, yourself with. Really outside my <laughs> wheelhouse, and you know what? It's not the cops I would have to worry about on that one. No kidding. Number two, it's a class two misdemeanor in North Carolina for an unmarried man and woman to occupy a hotel room for immoral purposes. That is, in fact, correct. It, there really is a law. Oh. It says, any man or woman found occupying the same bedroom in any hotel, public inn, or boarding house for any immoral purpose, or any man and woman falsely registering as, or otherwise representing themselves to be, husband and wife in any hotel, public inn, or boarding house, shall be deemed guilty of a class two misdemeanor. Hmm. I don't know that anybody's been prosecuted for that in a long time, but okay. And number one, in North Carolina, it is legal to marry your first cousin. Um, okay, so what? That's legal in a lot of states. I yeah. Mean, like, a lot of states. Why that's a bizarre law, I don't know. But there you go. Yeah. I'm not sure why anybody would marry their first cousin because, I mean, that'd be kind of awkward at family reunions. Yeah. The family reunions would be short. Yeah, true. Here's a tip, guys. If you're going to post crap on the internet about how something's weird, Maybe you should post stuff that you can back up with, like, sites. But it's just so much more fun just to say, hey, I heard my, you know, my cousin's friend's sister's mother's boyfriend said yeah. this happened. I keep telling people the internet is the world's biggest bathroom wall. It just has a really good search function. There's nothing <laughs> that stops anybody from getting some kind of a tape recorder and recording the BS that they spout and having a conversation across Skype with other people and then taking that and putting it out as a podcast. Ha, we're case in point right here. Yeah. And there's nothing to stop people from writing any stupid thing they want on the internet, just like there's nothing to stop people from writing stupid things on the bathroom walls. Maybe it would be helpful if you had a site, some way to like... If you say something's against the law, point to the law, please. Yes. All right, Adam, what's bugging you this week? So recently, my contract with AT&T Wireless was up. It means I get a new phone, right? My wife's uh, was on Sprint. She and I both got our, uh, our last phones at the same time. She was on Sprint. I was on AT&T. Uh, Sprint, here in my area, they have been promising that they're going to have, you know, super high-speed 4G LTE for the last two and a half years. So we decided to ditch Sprint and go with, uh, with AT&T for her as well. Now, AT&T Wireless is the Comcast of wireless providers, and Comcast is the worst cable provider as far as customer service. People who are customers of Comcast will understand that. It is like pulling teeth to get anything correct. In fact, so I upgraded like three or four weeks ago. I got my phone. My new phone is the, the Galaxy Note 4. Yay. My wife's phone is the Moto X, the 2014 Moto X, which is also, you know, pretty big. But it was crazy, like, actually trying to get her set up on my account. We actually had to create a new account, and then I had to get a new phone number because she has had her phone number for the last, I don't know, 10 years or whatever, and they wouldn't port her number to an additional line on my existing account. So we had to create a new account and port her number to the new account and then create an additional, an additional line on that account with a brand new phone number. Now, I use Google Voice, so it doesn't really matter. Yeah, I was going to say, Google Voice, there's your friend right there. Exactly, exactly. And when I did that, so now I've got three phones, right? <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, I just need to cancel this other one. And the guy in retention was like, oh, no, we can just add that to, to those other two lines that you already have. <laughs> and it's only going to be like $10 a month. I'm like, no, 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 I, I don't need it. And he's like, well... Wouldn't you like a spare phone? Wouldn't that be I'm like, no, <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't. It's like, well, what if your other, what if you, what if you drop your other phone? I was like, then I'll take the SIM card out and put it in one of my old phones. Come on guys. Like really? The other thing was that when they shipped my Galaxy Note 4, I pre-ordered it and it actually showed up to my door and 
it was still in pre-order processing on their website. So I couldn't actually activate it. I had to go into a store to activate my phone. And then they, it took them like an hour to figure out what was going on. I mean, just the only reason why I deal with these people is because they're the least crappy provider. Same for Comcast. And now I don't have to do this again for another two and a half years. So I'm really excited. (sighs) You know, it's like sometimes you just want to line them up and give them all a slap. Yeah. Or you slap the first one and tell him he has to slap the next guy or you'll slap him again. <laughs> Keep passing it down the line. Yeah. I don't know what to tell you. I don't either. Well, that's our show for the week. Thanks again to Rob Allen for our music and thank you for listening to the Gunblog Variety Cast. Constructive criticism can be sent to Sean at SeanSorrentino.com and hate mail to WizardPC at GunsCarsTech.com. Show notes can be found at GunblogVarietyCast.com forward slash episode 11. 